Yo. Hey. How is life? How is life? It's okay. I just be myself outside in Helsinki. Ready? Yes. So where the fuck are we now? Where are you, man? I'm here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Helsinki. Helsinki in the biohacking summit. Um, 2022. 2022. We are very good friends, but we don't see each other very often because we live in uh, different towns. Mm. Uh, Gekko lives in Oslo. I live in a town called Söda. Mm. So we're apart, but uh, every time we meet, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's been five months, three years. But the last time I met you was about 10 months ago yeah. while you were at, uh, at the hospital. Mm. Uh, it was a very strong and uh, emotional uh, time because mm. uh, uh, you're actually in a wheelchair. Mm. You didn't used to be. No, I didn't. And uh, that's also the reason why we're here. The main reason why we're here is because I ended up in a wheelchair and my life goal now is to optimize my body and get back on my feet. Uh, trying to learn as much as I can in this fucked up situation. So yeah, that's the main reason why we're here. And then I posted on Instagram because they invited me here. Because first I was writing to them, hey, where can I see this live? I really want to learn, I want to see this stuff. And, and they just wrote back, hey, we really want to invite you. We, we went through your profile and we, it was uh, inspiring. And uh, we want to invite you to Helsinki. And I just felt like I had to go. Even though it's hard for me to travel because it's not so long ago uh, since my injury. And last time I traveled was to Panama to do stem cells. And that was the worst trip in my life. Uh, another experience uh, traveling in a wheelchair. And I didn't, I hated it. So when they invited me, I was like, fuck, I have to do this. I have to travel alone. Uh, and I have to... Uh, just I have to go through this experience and I did so I traveled to uh, I took the taxi out to the airport and all the feeling came came to me like this is it's fucked up I'm, I'm in a taxi on my way to Helsinki in a fucking wheelchair it's it's gonna be something different than I'm used to be that it used to be I mean and yeah many emotional uh, feelings and uh, what can I say? A different type of traveling. Uh, sitting in a wheelchair, people have to ha like carry my uh, luggage and uh, help me through the security and just all the thoughts spinning through the airport. Yeah. <laughs> people like I'm feeling people looking at me. Maybe, but it's probably not. But it's just the feeling I get because it's so weird mm. sitting here. You know, sitting all the time. Let's explain everybody why it's weird. Let me tell uh, folks at home mm. what you were like when I met you. Mm. I was uh, hired to open uh, a CrossFit center in uh, in Haugesund, a small town in uh, Norway. Mm. Uh, and you were at the moment dating the owner's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. You were like the fit couple. Yeah. <laughs> you were really the fit couple. How old were you then? Like 20 or something? 19? How old were I? Maybe around, yeah, around 20, 21. I maybe. think it's 10 years ago. It's 10 years ago. Yeah, then it's 21. Then I was around 21. Around 21. Yeah. And we instantly clicked because we were both very competitive and we liked to challenge each other. And uh, I was, uh, CrossFit was completely new in Norway. I think our uh, our box was like the number 14 in Norway. So yeah. It was uh, still a very small community. You were already uh, a fighter, you were a kickboxer, and uh, started to dabble with MMA yeah so Shit. yeah it that. was it was uh, it was like the birth of who you were uh, gonna become yeah. you know and uh, I remember like the we had every what was it? every Tuesday or every Wednesday we had this two-hour um, class outside class we're running through the forest uh, swimming through ice water climbing trees carrying logs all that crawling through mud and uh, uh, woods and branches and everything and that was where, where we really really 
connected. Yeah, that was like, oh my god, this guy is just like me, and he's challenging me. So we were both like, whoosh, 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 yeah. whoosh, upping the ante all the time, yeah. having so much fun. You were like, I'm gonna be the best at a handstand, and I was like, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and then we battled so much, and it was uh, that that those two years uh, were really great. Yeah, and uh, that's where we have that deep connection that makes it so easy to. Just meet up and uh, and start talking again, challenging mm. each other just straight away, mm. just being happy. We don't have to say hello. We don't have to say goodbye. It's just uh, just like that. Mm. You're the most active guy I have ever known and the most um, energetic guy. Yeah. You're so creative with everything you did. Mm. And that inspired me so much. Uh, and then I quit that job after two years. Uh, and that's when we started to not see as much of each other as we had, mm. but we still uh, kept in touch. And when I saw your message that you wanted somebody to come with you to Finland, I was like, oh man, I was at work. I didn't even actually have the time to go. But you said, anything is possible, man. And I just like, dude, comes from a guy in a wheelchair. <laughs> so I just scrambled and I made it happen. I was late yesterday, but it was so, I just got a really good feeling yeah uh, when I got to see you yeah uh, because this uh, summit is all about learning what we can do like what can we do mm. there's so many studies there's so many opinions about paralyzed people yeah can't they can never walk again you've been told you can never walk again what is your take on uh, on that kind of comment how do you how do you take that in like first when they say when when uh when a doctor with it around, or orthoped, uh, orthopedia that had around 30 years of experience telling me that, it feels, it was like, okay, I'm fucked. My worst nightmare just happened. And this, at the same time, I was like, this is not happening <laughs> because it was so, <laughs> it was so fucked up, you know? And it's, so, but something inside me, like the person I am just said like, they're wrong. And then I start Google straight away. I start searching, and I start uh, reading about it. And the thing is, with the with the spinal cord, it's the same thing as the brain. It's just a longer brain. <laughs> yeah, so, it's, it's fiber, like nerve fibers. Yes, that's basically made of the same stuff. Yes, but the difference is that it's not so much plasticity in the uh, in the spinal cord mm -hmm. as they think. Yeah. But they've seen people walk again that shouldn't walk again. People that ripped off the whole spine and they walk again. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that the thing that they tell me, they don't even know. They really don't know about it. It's, it's like it's like space. It's like the galaxy. Yeah. The brain is like the galaxy. And the more studies they do, the more they found out. And they also, the more they find out they don't know. Right. And that's what I feel about the spinal cord as well. And also my feeling inside me that's told me, like, they're wrong. It's going to happen. First, I was... I was like battling against the, the feeling like, okay, this is just because you're so afraid of living in a wheelchair. That's why you're saying that you're going to walk again, like for myself, right? But I still have the feeling I'm going to walk again and I'm going to do everything I can. And that's like the reason why we're here now as well. Like we've said so many times and it's, they don't know what, what I can do and they cannot compare me with everybody else because they don't know me. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yeah. And... <laughs> And I've already done stupid stuff like walk six hours a day, six times a week uh, in six months. So someone is standing, uh, holding my legs and then moving my legs while I'm uh, in this harness. Yeah. And, and I'm moving my legs and I'm trying to move, move them with them, with my, with my, with my, with my thoughts and trying to feel the steps and just imagine how it is to walk again. And I've done that for fucking six months. Who, who else does that? No one does it. The it doctor didn't, didn't even think it was a good idea. No, they were like, you know, it's, some of them even, I heard some of them said it was like he's wasting his time. Mm. And that's the thing. And I also heard one one of the biggest scientists when it comes to spinal cord injury and, and uh, stem cells when it comes to spinal cord injury recovery. And he said, the doctor should stop telling the people that get spinal cord injury they will never walk again because they don't really don't know. They can say it's a big chance, but it's also a small chance you can walk again mm. because we don't know so much about it. And he said people that don't listen to the doctors, those are the ones that, uh, um, how can I say it? Those are, he, he said that he was, he was happy about all the people that don't listen to the doctor and trying even 
even though they tell, they're telling them that they're not going to walk again, because those are the people that brings it. Uh, how can I say it? They're surprising people. Yeah. And also, that's that's how everything is. Like they said that we can never uh, land on the moon either. We've done it. If you think long, many years before that, they were like, "No, it's impossible. Nothing is impossible." The Earth so, was the center of the universe. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and everybody was sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, if you think about the technology that they even said at the Biohacking Summit, it said that the technology is going faster and faster, and the technology we just had in 2000. 2000 Imagine what we have now, how fast it went. Just yeah. rem- the first computers, the internet. iPhone is from 19, no, t- 2007. Exactly. And look how it is now. Yeah. I even remember, uh, I remember one talk me and my mom had. We said that, imagine in the future that we can look at each other while we talk Whoa. on the cell phone. We were like, oh shit, you know. And that was happening. And so, so long ago, we talked about it in the car. I remember I saw a, a futuristic commercial from a, a cell phone uh, company in Norway years and years ago. And uh, they were just filming a woman giving birth, you know, just uh, the dad's view of it, yeah. you know. And then they, uh, the child came out and everything and was crying. And then they just zoomed out to a guy sitting in the North Sea on an oil platform watching his phone with his friends. And everybody was congratulating oh, him and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it yeah. was so far out. I yeah. didn't believe it when I saw it. Yeah. That's where we're at now. Exactly. And we we're even better than that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so even though I'm doing everything I can, I'm also thinking that when I do all this movement, I don't forget it. Because I asked one uh, woman in a wheelchair, do you remember how it is to move your feet? Because she's been in a wheelchair for 30 years or something. She said, no, I don't remember. And I thought straight away, I'm not going to be like that. Not I'm going yeah. not going to forget any movements. And I'm going to keep my body uh, going because... If you don't use it, you lose it, right? Yeah. So I just do all this exercise, uh, do a lot of weight bearing so I don't lose my the, uh, bone uh, density. Mm-hmm. And I do all of this stuff because even though I don't get up at time, maybe the technology will get me up. All right. And, and that's what I mean. So I'm, go- I'm going to walk again, 100%, but it just, like, I don't know what time. In order for people to uh, be able to understand how you can say that, why don't you explain some of your uh, upbringing, what you did as a kid, and how you evolved as an athlete, and what your plans were, what your goals were, mm. and so forth. So, like, even though I think I think it was around four, I don't know why I said four, but I don't know if mom said it or whatever, but I think it was around that, uh, around that age, and I told my mom that I, if I got paralyzed, I would, I would just die. And... Because I really, my the th- the love of my life was moving. I love experiencing new movements. If it was like just push, we start for push ups, you know, and then sit ups, start training. My body is getting stronger. Doing handstands, running a lot, trying climbing trees. Uh, so all my life has always been moving. I couldn't sit still. Maybe because I have ADHD as well. I don't know. But anyway, I, I love moving, and uh, I remember that I wanted to be, I don't know why though, maybe because of my, my I thought about it, maybe because the way I grew up, uh, I experienced a lot of violence in my life. Uh, and I think it's so, something about martial arts that triggers me. Mm-hmm. And I started as, a, I did uh, judo first. Mm-hmm. When everybody else was doing, doing uh, football, yeah. S- soccer, yeah. Everyone in my class was doing soccer. And I re- even remember my best friends like, why are you not joining? I'm like, I don't want to do judo. I want, I want to fight. And that was also a bit strange for people, you know. Yeah. And I liked that. Even that time I liked being the strange guy <laughs> somehow. Uh, and then I moved to Haugesund. And in Haugesund, I started doing kickboxing. Um, and I remember around, I don't, around when I was 16 or something, I think I was like, I want to do everything. I want to do all the martial arts. And I didn't even know about MMA that time. But in my head, I wanted to do uh, wrestling. I wanted to do kickboxing, judo. I wanted to do everything. I didn't, I just, I didn't mix it in my head because I wanted to be the, like the ultimate fighter. Yeah. Bring the best parts of uh, every every yes 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 because i couldn't train everyone but i need to find the one that i liked and the one that i thought was most effective because that's the thing that triggered me and 
fast forward and I start looking at MMA and I love it. I just as real as it gets. That's what they call it. And it and for me that was like the how can I say it? For me that that time was like when I know when when I experienced when I watched MMA I was like that's gonna be me one day because I already thought about it for so uh, so many years but I didn't know it was something called MMA mixed martial arts and I love doing everything so why not try it and at that time it wasn't so many MMA centers in Norway uh, I think it was uh, I think at first when I started it was in Stavanger. Uh, I heard about one place called uh, Stavanger MMA Center, and the guy there was crazy. He trained people in Bali It was so hard training, and so that also triggered me. Yeah, because you had experience with hard training from one of your other coaches, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, when yeah, you were he really, kids. yeah. When I was a kid, he really pushed me. It, it was too much, but I was like, I loved it. I want more. You, you cannot break me, you know. What, what did he give you? I remember that he wanted me to, because I trained in two clubs, because the the clubs were rival. There was something something happening. Anyway, I trained in two clubs because I started first at Hugus uh, and kickboxing, and then one other guy came in as a coach, and then it was some arguments. And then he started his own club, and I wanted to join both. And I trained two times a day. I was already done. I think it was around fourteen, fifteen. I don't remember. Anyway, and. I remember I did also did weight training because I, I found the magazine and was like, "Do you want to get stronger?" <laughs> and all that. Oh, do you mean old internet? Uh -huh. Old no. internet, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it was like it was a program, everything I could do, and I that just triggered me like a systematic program. Okay, so if I lift 80 kilos in four weeks, I can lift fucking 90 kilos, you know? And I was like, "Whoa!" So and also in the in the same magazine, it was, it was called Tech Nutrition. Uh, it was also uh, about dieting, and I read that magazine like 10 times because I would learn everything about it. And I started doing uh, weight training as well. And they, one of the coaches, he was he was uh, working at the place that I did weights. And he all, I also started doing uh, intervals, four times four. And I read how to do it, and I did it. And he came in, he was like, "It's you have to run faster, and you have to have more an incline. I'm like, no, are you sure? He's like, yes, because if you're going to be a, be a world champion, you have to do like I say. I'm like, okay. And he fucking went up in incline. It put on like 18 in speed. I was supposed to run four minutes <laughs> and three minutes. Like, you know, I was Gave like, you an impossible task, basically. Exactly. And I was so... I did it. And I, well, I tried it, but I couldn't do it. My legs was like, I was not like falling. And I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, man, come on, push yourself. And he really pushed me. And, and I remember that time when I came home, I was so sad because I couldn't do it. And that pissed me off and it annoyed me so much. So I was like planning how I'm going to do it. Like, because mentally I was there, but my body gave up. And I was, oh, I'm, I'm, I have to be strong mentally. But it wasn't my, it wasn't my, because I really tried, but I fell off and I tried again. He was like, come on, man, come on, you can do it. And then later, of course, I learned that he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> It's not possible. Well, it is possible, but I'm not a runner. I'm not a sprinter. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And also, all other training as well. I was 14, 16 years old. You know, you shouldn't push. <laughs> you know, you should build people up at that time. But for me, I just took an excellent experience. And also, also that also took me to learn more about training. So if someone, people, if someone said something to me, then I had experience myself. Then I can question them, you know? Because yeah. you always ask, you, you should always ask why. And like you have had an explanation, and if it makes sense for you, yeah, then you can check into it, and maybe yeah, it makes sense. Then you can try to do it, but just don't take everything as people say. Yeah, I would do it because you said because you're my coach. So many stupid coaches out there. Mm. So uh, from there, uh, I'll start building muscles. You know, getting more testosterone, looking at and all that. <laughs> girls, you mean? <laughs> girls. I mean, yeah, girls. And then. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've been all, and all, all of my friends would start drinking. I didn't because one of the coaches told me if you drink one time, you'll ruin four, uh, three months of training. I'm like, fuck, hell no. I'm not gonna <laughs> ruin three months of training. <laughs> fuck that. And uh, so I was quite strict from early on. I even remember we went to holiday and I asked my mom, but is there any training centers nearby? Is it one of the places it's not? But and I'm like, but then I can't go. 
because I have my following my program and I'm, I'm going to do 100 kilos in squats soon, you know. <laughs> and, she, and she was like, yeah, can't cool. go on a vacation because <laughs> of that. Can I go on vacation because <laughs> of that? And then she was like, but you can do other stuff. And she was, I was like, yeah, she's right. I can do other stuff. I can lift stones. I can do more squats. You know, it's only a couple of weeks, so maybe I don't ruin it. But it was, it was, I was battling it uh, with a thought. But, I, of course, I went and I did fucking thousand push-ups you know i was really crazy because i really wanted to because i well you i was supposed to do the weight um uh, what is it called uh, bench, bench bench press, press yeah, yeah. With, with with the weights with dumbbells but then instead i was thinking okay since i'm gonna do 30 kilos uh four times uh, four or something i'm gonna do a uh, thousand push-ups all to together compensate. Yeah, to compensate for for not to be able to lift in heavy weight on the whole holiday, you know. And yeah. of course, I did it. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I learned a lot about that as well, like how to coach yourself, basically. Yeah, coach myself because I never had a coach really before my MF, my MF first MMA fight as well. I didn't really have a coach. I brought my girlfriend that time and my little brother. They were standing in the corner and yelling like, uh, yes, uh, good, uh, punch, punch him. him in the face, punch <laughs> him in the face. So I'm like, you know, I didn't have any coach. So, yeah, I learned a lot myself. And that was al always, even to the, like, when I moved to Oslo and really, really went for the career in MMA, I always wanted a coach that could tell me everything I can do, so that I trusted, you know. Because now I learn a lot myself and I read a lot and I'm doing a lot of research. So I have to trust it. I have to really believe what the coach says. Because if we believe something, it really, it really matters. It really uh, strengthens everything you do. Mm. So, yeah. So, uh, and you were actually... Um so this is when we were like uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, around that. And uh, planning to become the ultimate uh, fighter and everything. Yeah. And then uh, that's when we met around that time. Yeah. A little later when we were like 20, 21 or something. Yeah. Uh, and that's when we started to train together. And yeah. uh, we had a... Uh, like I brought some new stuff to your table. The yeah. two you were just like... <laughs> you just yeah. sucked it up. Yeah. And, uh, and we had all these... Uh, Great times, uh, and then you were actually um, t tell tell me about the reality show that you were on. Uh, yeah, it was me and uh, my girlfriend at that time, Lotte. We were living in Stavanger, and it came up on TV. Are you Norwegian toughest? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> of, like, of course, I'm the toughest. And yeah. I'm like, Lotte, let's sign up. Yeah, because they were looking for participants yeah, for the yeah, show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we signed up and I wrote everything that I thought they would like to hear. Mm -hmm. And Like was was like what? You know, you like, remember? it was, no, it was just questions. I was very cocky because i always been cocky. And, but that I was really exaggerating. Like, man, it, like, what question was it? Uh, let us say... Like, are you a Norwegian tough, uh, tough? Why are you a Norwegian toughest? Because everything I join, everything I participate in, I always win. Mm -hmm. uh, since I was a kid, I always win. If it's, it's just like, uh, yeah, whatever it is, I always win. And that's why I'm Norwegian toughest. So if you don't pick me, it's, it's your loss. And, you know, stuff like that. You yeah. know, the way I ate. So, so the show was called the toughest, uh, like, if you translate it, it would be something like uh, the toughest person in Norway. Yes, yes. Or, yes. like, the toughest guy in Norway. But yeah. it was both guys and girls, right? Yeah, both yeah. guys and girls. So it was supposed to be, I think it was five girls and five guys. Yeah, I think so. And um, they invited me to an uh, interview. And they have to do a lot of tasks. And also with other like uh, cooperation tasks and stuff like that and I remember <laughs> I was so hangover because I didn't sleep all night because I was living in uh, when I went because the, the, the interview was not so that time I lived in her in Stavanger yeah. was in I was in Haugesen actually I, I remember I, I slept at a, at a gym frontline my tie and they were training six in the morning and I couldn't fucking sleep because it was so hot and you, was, you slept at a gym. I slept at a gym yeah. on the fucking floor, you know. On the, That's how on you the break mats. in, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then, and then in the morning, six o'clock. So I had a, like three hours sleep or something. Six o'clock in the morning, I had a workout. Then I went for the interviews. And then Lotte came with a plane later or something. And 
I remember I was so hangover, so I just poured in with a lot of caffeine, and, and me reacting to caffeine is like speed, because I'm very sensitive to caffeine, so... Uh, I remember I was... When I did stuff, I was like, I'm so fucking stupid, like... I can't shut the fuck up. I was talking so much. I was like, Nelly, I, I, I bet they were thinking I was on speed because I was so excited. And I was <laughs> fucking, you know, like commenting at everything they did. Yeah, I'm a tough guy. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. You want more push-ups? How many push-ups do you want? 50. Do, 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 do. You want more? You know, I was so fucking <laughs> cocky. And, and I knew straight away that they wanted me. I knew like all the other uh, people. I was like, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. I was so cocky when I was there. My, my, I just thought that uh, I know they want me. I just noticed everything they said and like, yeah, you know. So, and they picked me. And uh, even the, when we came into the Norwegian toughest, I remember the bus. They were driving us to the. We were going to stay in a. Uh, what is it called? Uh, a bunker. Yeah, a bunker inside the mountain. Yeah, like an underground bunker from the war or something. Yeah, yeah. I remember it was like dripping water and moss growing and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and I loved it. Yeah. Because since I was a kid, I've always been thinking that... This was in the show, right? That, that the show was like, ten, put 10 people inside that bunker. Sleep you're going to sleep there. And you got like surprised during you know, nights and all of a sudden you had to go outside and run and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also like, less food, less sleep. Yeah. And that's that's the stuff that uh, fuck up your mind, and that's what I wanted because I couldn't go to the military because I was a father. Yeah, <laughs> I really wanted to be a, 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 a what is it called? Special Forces, uh, yeah, Marine, Marine. Yeah, um, and uh, s- since I couldn't go to the military, that was like the the closest I could, could I could try, you know. Yeah, uh, and when we were there. I just loved it. Everything, like, we couldn't, we didn't sleep much, we didn't have a lot of food, and I'd look at other people complaining, I'm like, come on, you know, you cannot break I gotta me. tell this story. I watched the show, obviously, because uh, I knew you then, and we were like, yeah. me and my wife at home, we were like, yeah, man. It was so funny, because everybody was like, as you said, they were getting tired, they were getting, their minds was getting, you know, uh, fatigued and everything, and uh, not a lot of sleep, not a lot of food, a lot of hard exercise, but still, all of a sudden, you get this uh, surveillance camera of you getting up in the middle of the night. You're like sleeping like three hours, and still you got up and you put on a Slender Man suit yeah, and started freaking everybody out. And they were like, "What the <laughs> hell is going on?" <laughs> so that's kind of that's the kind of energy you bring to the table. Yeah, always. Yeah, always been like that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I remember that. That was funny. I was thinking like, okay, because I really wanted to do it, but then I'm thinking I have to be smart also. But it's quite tactical because if I wake them up, they're probably not going to sleep. <laughs> and then I can go, you know? So I was like, I was thinking I was so smart. But uh, many people didn't react so much. They were like, oh, go to bed. Uh, they were so tired. They were but, annoyed. Yeah, they were annoyed. But I was like, fuck, anyway, I, it was fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, also the thing that is like me being cocky, uh, in the same thing, uh, like in that competition, I looked at everyone and was like, I'm, I'm going to beat him. He's not stronger than me, you know? And also, ev- like, I nearly won every competition in there as well. And that brought me, like, I was more and more confident that I'm going to win the whole show. And that's always, that's, like, also, also, I brought that to fighting. Because I was always thinking, I'm, I'm always training more than him. I'm doing more than him. So why should he win? I deserve to win, mm-hmm. you know? And that's also the thing I can bring here now. Right. Yeah. With the walking. Yeah. I deserve to walk. Yeah. You can see somebody in a wheelchair and say, I'm stronger than him. Yeah. I'm fucking stronger <laughs> than him. But he hasn't done fucking six hours every day for six months, you know? Yeah. And then, so, so it's, uh, I think that's a good thing to bring to the table now as well. Yeah. Obviously, you won. I won. Yeah. No problem. Of course. No yeah. problem. Uh, <laughs> So that, that got you a lot of confidence. It did. Yeah. And then you can... So how did you use that sort of to uh, uh, to evolve your fighting skills? Or how did you how did you go from there to uh, becoming an MMA fighter for real? First, uh, in the start of my MMA career, I was like... I had, my background was Thai boxing. And I knew if you search my name on YouTube, you will find Thai boxing matches. And then you want me to the ground. So one of the first things I, I thought is like, okay, if I'm going to fight me, I want to take him to the ground. 
such, I, I did a lot of jiu-jitsu training and I loved it. Uh, for me, it was uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was quite new for me, and but I, I just loved it. So the first four fight that I had uh, went to the ground. I ended up on I ended up on top, and I did ground and pound and won the fight. And that also brought got, got me gave me more confidence. But the thing I didn't know was about wrestling. At that time, it was jiu-jitsu and Thai boxing. Wrestling people didn't talk about wrestling that time, but that's one of the main things you should really have when it comes to MMA. It's really efficient. Yeah, it is. So so the second fight I had was against a Chechen guy, and he probably grew up with uh, like wrestling bears and stuff. That's <laughs> so. Of course, he's a wolf, right? Yeah, exactly. So he, he, uh, he, re- he wrestled fucked me. That's what he said. <laughs> he wrestled fucked me. And I, I, was, I was so frustrated because he didn't do much. He was like holding me down. I'm like fight you know like punch do something but he was just holding me down trying to get a position and he was exhausted by the end but i was not but even though he won the fight and it was so annoying because i felt like i could do more because i wasn't exhausted and he won the fight for what he didn't i didn't have a scratch and he was standing in the corner puking after the fight because he had so much adrenaline dump you know (laughs) and i'm like you know so I also was a Chechen guy. I grew up with Chechens, and so we two got a, a, a really good friends. And I said, "I want to come down. You have to teach me more wrestling and all that." So yeah, uh, yeah. So you were beaten, and you were immediately. Your immediate thought was that I need to know that. Yeah, yeah. Because MMA is is it's so much. It's it's so much. You know, it's, you, you you could be the best fighter, and then you can meet a guy that's so much better than you in just wrestling, right. and he can beat you. And that's the hard thing about MMA. And that for me also was, was like, uh, I liked it, but at the same time it was new for me because normally when I train more than other people or whatever I do, I always win. But I didn't win that fight, and he was not the same shape as I was. Yeah. I, even his friend told me that he was smoking weed a lot before the fight, so he he didn't he wasn't such such a good shape. And that's also was like, well, why did why did he win then? You know, it was annoying, and that's also that made me think about how I should. Uh, adapt and change my M- MMA game to be the best fighter because that was always my goal to be one of the best fighters because I know even the day today I have everything that uh, I need to be the best fighter and so for me I think I uh, uh, the MMA when I started doing MMA that really triggered me also like I said because it challenged me more than anything else on this that, that I've tried anything else like CrossFit it was challenging but I it was it was easier, if I can put it that way. Yeah, it, there's uh, there's not as much money in the game. You no. know, it's just yourself trying to make yourself puke or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's yourself. You don't have an opponent. No, exactly. And also that also one of if people ask like, but isn't it hard? Isn't it? And I always use this as as an example how it is to fight. You remember when we were kids, we were running around in the playground, climbing, and doing all of this crazy stuff, and then. When you sat down, then you notice how, how tired it was. Mm. But it was so fun, so you forgot about it. And the same thing with MMA for me when it comes, when it comes to the training. And that's again uh, told me that it, I'm in flow state. I just love what I do. So I, I'm lucky. I found a thing that I really, really love. I think about it every night. I dream about it. Even when I, walk, uh, when I was walking on the street, I did like combinations in the air, you know. You know, so everything for me, I was breathing MMA. So that's also one of the things that I'm saying. That's what I think I could be the best in the world because I had everything. It's, it's not just talent. It's just of the physical part aspect of it. It's everything. It's also the mind, you know, and that's one of the most important of things course, uh, yeah. when it comes to fighting. Hmm. So uh, uh, after a while, you weren't challenged, not even though you had at that time your own MMA center even. Yeah. Yeah, the thing it wasn't. The thing is that it wasn't a lot of people. Uh, it was. It was. We had maybe four or five fighters that had like that that, that fought that competed, but no one really wanted to reach the top. And for me, that time it was like I need to move because I don't have more hair. I don't have more hair to like. I'm I'm the best fighter here. I'm mm-hmm. the best MMA fighter. Well, I have better jiu-jitsu fighters, but I'm not a jiu-jitsu, a jiu-jitsu fighter. I need to fight against, I need to uh, spar against better and train against with better uh, uh, competition in training. And that's why I went to Oslo. 
Uh, so I leave, left everything behind. That's one of the hardest things I've done because my, even my son, he moved, he moved into my mom. And I just really felt that this, that was the time to do it. And also one of my best friends, uh, Emil Mek, he was a, a famous fighter. Uh, well, he is a famous fighter in Norway. And I know that he could teach me a lot. And also, uh, he's bigger and stronger than me. So in my head, I was like, okay, when I move to Oslo, I'm gonna, the first goal has to be taking him down because he's much better wrestler than me and he's stronger than me. So I have all of these goals in my head that I have to achieve when I'm in Oslo. But in Haugesen, it wasn't, well, I can try to tap out Vega or Tommy and all that, but it wasn't more than that because I was the best stand up fighter and I had good wrestling. So that's why I went. I need to evolve, I need to get better, and many of the people have been long in the game. And also, the thing is, I wanted a coach. I didn't have a coach in, uh, in nice. Haugesen. I was coaching myself and my friends were, co we were coaching each other. That was one of the things I really missed since I was little. When I did judo, I had a coach. I loved it. When I went to kickboxing, I had many coaches, but it was some, but some of the stuff I didn't, I didn't trust them because I learned a lot myself. And uh, so, so that's what I was missing. One coach really following me and like really believing in me. Because it's enough for believing in yourself, but it's extra strong as someone around you that sees you every day also believe in you. So that's what I was looking for. And that's why I moved to Oslo. And, uh, and, and things were going really good. Things yeah. started to go good. Yeah. Like, what did you do? What happened? What kind of things went on? First, I remember the first trainings. I was so excited because I got beaten with so many guys. It wasn't just one guy. It was so many guys that beat me in different aspects of the game. The floor on the ground, uh, standing. That was I was always the best standing. They were beating me standing, and the wrestling there was new for me. The wall wall wrestling. So I would start making uh, goals in my head, like this guy. He's the same weight as me. He's better than standing than me, so I have to beat him. And you know, uh, and then I had I remember the first fight I had because uh, before that I had an injury and all that. So I didn't fight for I think it was three years since I fought. Yeah, because you had a bad knee. I had a bad knee. I, yeah. I tore my ACL in the World Championship in MMA oh. uh, at the amateur. And my goal was to be, be a professional. But then I suddenly got uh, someone asking me if I want to have a fight. And that was 24, in 24 hours. And I heard about this guy called Samuel Bach. He was like a famous uh, Thai boxer. Went into MMA. And he was the main, on the main, uh, main card. And I said, of course, I want to fight, you know, an like, amateur fight, and he's a Thai boxer, so I can beat him easy. So I took the fight under 24 hours notice, and I went to Sweden, and I beat the guy uh, with wrestling, of course, because I didn't want to stand with him. But that was also one of the to uh, toughest stuff, uh, the, the, the hard stuff with me, is that I want to beat him in his game. But it's not smart. You should also fight smart. Oh, yeah. and that's also the thing that I learned in, in Oslo. I need to... I need to be smarter when I fight. I cannot beat... Well, I can beat him in this game, but it's not the smartest thing. Okay, so my goal was to take him down, beat him on the ground, and after beating him on the ground, he will lose his confidence, then I can beat him standing, you know? So after the fight, I was trying to go for professional. Uh, well, I wasn't trying. I was going for professional. And then I had a fight in England, and there were something called journeyman it's people that just fight they don't care if they lose or win and that's not the competition I want because in my career at that time I think I have 11 wins and 3 loss and there was amateur fights and I fought so many tough guys some of the guys I knew you've seen are unbeaten and I didn't want that that didn't trigger me to fight against a journeyman and then they were like yeah but you have to build up your record because that's your CV for the next fight and blah blah but I don't care how I rather want to lose against a good opponent than win against an opponent that maybe don't even want to win. He just want the money. And I remember that they tried to find a better opponent and they found one that had six wins and four loss. It's not that bad. It's professional. I have zero. I have never had a professional fight. So yeah, I'll take that fight. And right before I went to England, it, they called me and said, man, he, we have to pull him out. I'm like, why? Because he was strange. I'm like, what do you mean strange? No, I think he had too many blows to his head. To his head. I'm like, okay, that's that's a strange thing to say now. And then we can try to find a new uh, opponent for you. 
and they found one and I didn't really check him up. And then one of my friends called me and said, hey, have you seen your opponent? I'm like, no. Yeah, well, I see that they lost one fight or two fights in professional. That's it. Yeah, but have you seen his amateur record? I don't know. He has zero win and 27 losses. And that, I was like, my whole fucking world, like, collapsed. I'm like, you see, like, I trained so hard for this fight. First professional fight. Now I'm in England. And I'm going to fight against a guy that just wants the money. I don't want that. And then I called my uh, airman, and he was like, come on, man, you, you know, just, just go and have the fight. It doesn't matter. And I went in, and the fight took, like, 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds. He tried to kick me, fell down, I took him to the ground, I ended up on top, uh, ground and pound, finish. And I, the feeling that I got from winning that fight was the, one of the worst feelings in my career, because that was not me. I didn't want to be the guy who have like 10 wins and zero loss, but the guy that I fought is just journeyman. People, uh, uh, taxi drivers that want some extra money. So after I just said, uh, from now I'm just going to take tough fights. I don't care what they say. I, th that's for me, the, the person I, even though it's smart to do some, e some easy fights, but for me I wasn't, I just going to take whatever because I know what I can beat him. And then I got my, my second fight, professional fight against a very tough up-and-coming opponent in Sweden. Uh, and he was quite big in my weight class as well, and that triggers me a lot. At that time, it was around COVID, I didn't really train good enough because we didn't have a place to train, so we trained at the yoga studio. I trained a lot, but it wasn't the quality. Also, I didn't have a coach. And they separated the team. Some of the team would, uh, uh, would be able to train, some of them were not. So I was like left a little bit out with a lot of other fighters. So it was just some fighters left. Uh, like the, ma the best fighter that he had, they were only focusing on them. And that was for me was like quite disappointing because I've been, since I moved to Oslo, I, I never, uh, I always went to training. If I didn't go to training, I have to have an, uh, a proper excuse. I have to say like, okay, so I'm sick, so I can't come in today. But if it was like I was tired and stuff, I went. I always went to training, and I want to show the coaches I'm there for to, to reach the top. I'm not here just because I want to be one of the fighters. I want to reach the top, you know. So that time I was very hard because I didn't have a coach, and one guy he was coaching me, and I really didn't really. He was a good coach, and I liked that he used a lot of uh, energy on me, and he like sent texts, how was training today, and how would you think we're going to do this and that, and he built like a system. But he missed his, he was he was more like a stand-up coach. I needed the whole thing. I needed a main coach. And I really didn't really believe in the game plan that I had also, but I was just thinking, as long as I train hard, as long as I trained enough, I will win this fight. I went there. No coach joined me, so I asked one of my friends uh, in Sweden, or two of my friends in Sweden, to join me and be in my corner. I remember they were wrapping my hands. I was sitting there wrapping my hands, and it, it wasn't really good the way they wrapped it. And then I look at the other team uh, beside us. It was like uh, all stars in Sweden, and they had so good environment. They were laughing. The coaches did ex know exactly what to do. Suddenly the guy came. You are gonna have a fight in some few minutes. I didn't I hadn't, I hadn't warm up. I'm like. Oh, fuck, I'm stressed. And then you shouldn't stress, you just relax before fights. And then we went out doing warm up. It was something new. I did that. I'm not used to warm up like that. But the guy, my friends, they were used to that. And that's every, all of that. It's not doubting. I was not doubting myself. The first time in my career, I went in and I doubted myself in a fight. And that's the start of my professional career. I shouldn't be like that. And something was off. My mind was not there, and I was like doubting my game plan. I was like, come on, come on, just focus, focus. And I had the fight, and I got knocked out. Uh, and that was so hard for me to handle. But at the same time, that triggered me a lot to be better again. So I changed my game, uh, changed my plan, and I was going to move to Sweden to, uh, to join All Star Stockholm. Train with the best fighters. Comes out, he's up and coming fighter now. I think he's going to be bigger than uh, <laughs> McGregor one day. And he had so many good fighters and also a lot of Chechen guys living at the gym. And that also triggered me, you know, living at the gym in like hard environment. I love it. That's going to make me a better fighter. And I, that's how I grow. That's how since I was a kid, I always love, love. Um, Got it tough. Yeah, because that always made me tougher, you know. 
And right before the fire, before I was supposed to move, my girlfriend bought an apartment, and we were going to move in there. I'm going to go back and forth from Oslo to be with my girlfriend, also train some stand up, change gym and gym in Oslo as well, from Fontan Academy to Fontan Mai Thai, working on my stand up, and also going to uh, Stockholm before my fights. And then, yeah, and then the shit happened. Yeah. You were going up? I was going up, but then you went down. And I went down the crash. So one, uh, one. I think it was the second hot summer day in in uh, in uh, May in Oslo. Um, I remember that this, if like it was yesterday, because I wanted to uh, finish my training because I wanted to go out and be in the sun. Uh, and. I remember I called all of my friends sending texts, hey, you want to join after after the training? And they were like, yeah, we can't. You know. No one could. I was stressed because I wanted to do something, you know. And then one of my friends said, hey, but you can ask uh, one of my, my friends that, uh, that I'd just been with around all my other friends. I'd never been with him alone, but I, the guy was so cool. So one of my friends said, hey, you can ask Ahmad. I'm like, calling him, he want to join out. Yeah, I'm joining. Just gonna, I'm just going to do my uh, training and then we, I can pick you up and then we go. I did my training. The f- last uh, exercise I did was bicep curl. I remember they filmed me. I was like, this is the most important muscle in the body. Remember that guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I picked him up and asked, where should we go? And he's like, yeah, we can go to this uh, Huk. It's called Huk in Oslo. I said, nah. I think we should go to Sørenga because I was there yesterday and it was so nice. And also, I'm going to train with Emil and Kenneth Elvegård after, and that's quite close to Sørenga. And before that, I can bring you to Juicery. We can get a bowl. And he was like, "Yeah, let's go there. We got our bowl. First time he eating. Well, I cannot eat this. It's too beautiful. I cannot eat this. <laughs> like, Come on, man, it's so good." And then he ate it, and we went to for um, uh, we went all the way out to Pom- uh, Sørenga. There were so many people that were just o- when it was. Uh, opening from uh, uh, COVID, I think it was like the second day or third day or something. So it was packed with people there. Mm. And you know, it's boring to just lay there in the sun. I wanted to do something. There were so many people there. I called my friend Abba, say hey, you want to join? And he's like, uh, uh, yeah, we, we're going to join you and then we're going to go to training after. We met him up and we said, we need to find another place where it's not so many people. Went to another place. I remember yes, the day before I was also saying I was thinking ah, I saw one place. There wasn't so many people. There were people uh, swimming around there, like uh, jumping from the uh, jumping there in the water and all that. And we on the way there, it was more. Pe- I remember when st- stood at the opposite side. It was like it was a lot of people there, and uh, people were swimming and jumping. And we went around. And I remember that uh, I was so excited. I remember that feeling I had because it was a nice day. Everything was, it was shining. I was really looking forward for Emil and Kenneth to train with, 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 uh, together the first time because Kenneth was so, he's such a good stand-up coach. And I know Emil, he needs more stand-up. And I love when people that I love meet, you know. Mm. So I just had a nice feeling. It was such a nice day, and I'd be like thinking about the future and all that. It was, it's so funny because everything just came to me when we went went to that place. And I said to the people, "Let's, you know, I was thinking uh, one hour to training. Yeah, we have some time to do some, uh, to jump out, have some fun, playing in the water." And I also remember that uh, I told. Kenneth and I, come on, let's jump. They were like, I'm not gonna fucking swim. It's too cold. I'm like, come on, let's do it. You don't be a pussy because he's always calling me a pussy for everything I do. I was like, now you're a pussy. You're always calling me a pussy because I don't want to do stuff. And, and and then the thing is that I remember I looked at Nura, and Nura is Abbas's girlfriend. She was standing. She was looking at me. She was like, a little bit like, oh fuck. And I was thinking, oh, she's so cute because she wants to jump before me. Mm-hmm. Oh, she, she was like, uh, yes, gearing up. Like, yeah, she was like, ah. Oh. But she was like, yeah, I want. And it, uh, later she told me the reason why she was standing there, like stepping and stuff, is because she wanted to join, uh, jump before me because I'm always first. And I'm, she thinks that I'm so tough and all that. And, mm-hmm. I'm, and of course, it happened again. I was the first out. And I said to Abbas, because he was like looking at the water and like, 
yeah, he was hesitating, jumping. I'm like, Abbas, look now. And I took my arms to the side and I did a military dive. Head first, no Head hands. Head first, no hands. <laughs> Everything was white. I knew I was dead. I don't know what happened. I just knew I was dead. I was in this place, fourth dimension. <laughs> and I was talking to myself. Like, it felt so good to be there, but at the same time, like, my family and all that, I didn't have anything missing, you know, I didn't have anything that I, that I haven't done, I have a great life and all that, but the only thing that annoys me a bit was that I didn't tell my girlfriend that I love her. She told me, but I haven't told her yet. Mm. That, like, that annoyed, annoyed me, it was, it was... That was I, unfinished. I, yes, some unfinished business, you know. And then suddenly it went black. And then like two lightnings in my eyes or something, like a flash in my eyes. And then I knew I'm going to live. And I tried to take my breath. And then it was just water coming in. So I had to struggle to get up, start swimming towards the, the ladder. And... Uh, I remember that uh, it was so hard. I don't know why it was so hard. I didn't understand why it was so hard to swim. And I think I was thinking, like, don't panic. Just breathe. Calm. Keep keep it calm. Just breathe slowly. Don't panic. Because I was look like imagining my head, visualizing in my head. If I'm panicking, I'm like, <gasps> you know, if I'm like trying to relax, breathing. That's what I do when I fight as well. Relax, breathe. And that time, also around that time, I was focusing a lot of breathing. So I think that helped me a lot. So I started swimming against the ladder and I got, got a hold of it. Then I heard, like, I remember I saw Abbas' face. When I saw his face, that was a, reflex, uh, a reflection of what is happening. That was something bad that really happened. I didn't, I didn't understand it before I saw his face. I was looking in the mirror. I just saw his face. He was so scared. He was so sad. All the bad emotions and that also uh, scared me a bit because I didn't know anything mm. and then it was a lot of adrenaline as well I remember I looked up yeah, and you hadn't seen what you did I hadn't seen I didn't know anything yeah and I also remember Kenneth was yelling like to fucking jump 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 uh, you have to help me something like that yeah, jump in to, to help you right? yeah 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 and then I look up and I see Amma jump towards me and he had like white Nike socks on I'm like why does he have socks on <laughs> <laughs> and this is while you're like in excruciating pain exactly and uh, these are the kind of thoughts that I find it so interesting it is you know it is interesting but also because this story I've told so many times but it's always the details that people don't like it doesn't matter but it does matter because mm. that's how our brain works yeah and it also catches people because they probably think stuff like that as well but but he's saying it mm. you know that's interesting yeah and I remember I have that picture in my head is like it's quite funny it's like jumping because I know that he didn't want to take a swim <laughs> now we had to <laughs> now we had to <laughs> <laughs> so all these emotions and thoughts like going to your head like in a second, you know, yeah. jump out. And I remember when I was holding on the, on the ladder, I, I was so hard and I was, it was so far, I was so exhausted. And that also was weird for me. <laughs> Why was it exhausted just hold the ladder? Like, yeah. you, you're all weak. I was so weak. And, and then the pain started coming, the, 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 the neural pain. Uh, it, and that was like when people ask how the pain is it's like it's like burning and and electricity at the same time it was so fucking painful it was like when i closed mine i can see, I, eyes i can see like blood pulsing like with like lightning in my eyes it was so i can it's the worst worst is the worst pain i ever felt and I was trying a little bit to climb, but it was so much pain, so I couldn't do it. And that pissed me off as well, because I'm like, come on, I'm used to pain, you know, in my head. I can, I can do this, I can get up. And I didn't understand what it was. And then he's, I remember that I was thinking I would start fainting, because everything around me was like blurry. And then uh, at that time, I was sitting on his, on his feet like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was hanging on the ladder. He was hanging on the ladder, and he put my feet on, on him like this. Yeah. 
and he was like washing my face and my blood and when he washed my face I remember he said like like she like tried to calm me down and I'm trying to tell him that I can't feel my legs but it was so hard because my uh, my back was pressed out between my shoulders like the bone was pressed out so when I was talking it was like <laughs> I can't I can't feel my you know it was so hard to speak and also the pain was when I was talking I felt the pain and he's like, no, it's, it's just because the water is cold. And I thought that was so cute of him to try to calm me in that way. I know what fucking cold is. I do ice bath, ice baths all the time. I just swim under the ice. I know what cold is, you know. So I remember in my head. I thought it was cute of him to, you know, try to calm me down and comfort me. And he washed my blood away from my face. And I thought I was fainting, but I wasn't. It was just the blood. All that's why it was blurry. And then I look around and I see people on the other side where we, uh, where we came from, standing with the cell phones. And I was thinking like, if that was me, would I stand with a cell phone and film? I wouldn't do it. Like, I wouldn't do it. But it's, that's how we're lit now, you know? Yeah. And then uh, uh, I'm hearing like a lot of sirens. I was thinking about Badal. And I felt... Your girlfriend. My girlfriend, Badal, yeah. Uh, I, was, I felt... Not stupid, but well, some kind like some close to stupid, like mm. what I've done. Like, oh. yeah, like what the fuck? Like, yeah, why did I do why, that? Man. You know. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's always easy to think that after. And also thinking about it, like, this is not happening. It's not. I'm not paralyzed. It's not that. It's just whatever it is. And then suddenly, a guy. A fire a fireman he jumped out in the water and he looked at me and the moment he looked at me I was I felt I, I already felt calm but then I was like okay everything is under control now because the guy was really he, he he was in control he knew what he was doing he was confident he was so confident and that gave me a, like calmed me down even more even though I thought I was calm and then he asked if I can take some uh, uh, rope around my arms under my arms and then I thought you were gonna lift me up like that. Or I didn't. I didn't ask. I was just. Uh, he has control. And they asked if I can try to come, uh, climb the ladder, and I tried, but it was so painful. And they tried to help with the rope, but it, could, it was even more pain because it stretched, stretched my back. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. And he's like, okay, they had to find another way. And I've been in water for quite, a, quite a, uh, some time, and they found like a ladder uh, that they uh, took out in the water. It was like a chair on them. And he put he put me on it, and every like, how can I say it? Every time he like dragged dragged it up because it wasn't like it was like chick chick it wasn't chick, chick. No, it wasn't smooth. Every time it was like ah oh, fuck, it was the pain. <laughs> it was so painful. I'm like, I want to faint. I, w- I don't want to have. I don't want to be in this pain anymore. Mm. And then I came up, saw all my friends. They were stressed, and they had a. I saw how. How sad my friend, especially Abbas was, and they were like scared. And they gave me a shot, and they asked me a question, look at my eyes and all that. And I asked what is happening, and then they were like, we don't know anything yet. Uh, they got me in the van, uh, in the ambulance. I remember that the time when I saw Badal, and I felt so sad, and I felt, I think, I want to say sorry to her, because this is also going. <laughs> She was also affected by it, of course, obviously. In the van, I was like, my head was spinning and I was falling out and coming back, falling out, coming back. The drugs would start, start wor- working, I guess. Suddenly in the hospital, uh, the intensive, what is it called? Intensive care. Yeah, intensive care, whenever, like when you come in, with a lot of doctors. Emergency. And, uh, emergency room, yeah, everyone yeah. running around. And one of the, a woman told me, don't focus on people, just breathe and relax. Mm-hmm. Don't, it's got to be chaos here, and we used to it. So please, please don't. And I'm like, when she said don't, I'm like, trying to... What's keep, going on here? What's going on here? <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. So uh, from that on, it was like a movie. Like you see in the movie, you see it just like, have you seen the eyes closing and opening again, and a sudden another place, you don't know time, or where you don't know where you are. Open my eyes, it was lightning there, and they were asking me questions about like what I like the details of what I remember, and and they said that they couldn't uh, 
start the surgery because I was so cold. So they have to wait, they have to warm me up. And I was asking if I was if I was paralyzed, and they said that he couldn't say anything, but it looks bad. And that, when he said that, uh, this is just a nightmare. This is not happening. Because two weeks before it happened, my girlfriend asked me and Kenneth, that was also there, what we would do if we got paralyzed. And both were like, ha, we would buy a golden gun and shoot ourselves in the head. So I was thinking that we were still in the living room talking about it, and this was just mm. spinning through my head. This was just what I would wow, imagine. Man. So that was also one of the hard... That was also the thing that <sighs> gave me hope. Like, this is not happening. This is just me imagining the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. Like waking up there, you know. But that was not it. That was the real deal. And uh, it was really happening. And I remember opening my eyes and Bala stood there crying. And the hard part was also uh, seeing Kenneth standing there crying. Because Kenneth is a guy that never cries. Not because he wants to be tough. He's just he's just a very happy guy. Mm. And he's, he's like, he's never crying. And the way he explained it is like when he was driving home after this happened, his girlfriend called him and he's been together for six years and she was like, Kenneth, are you crying? And he was in the car like, yeah, and it, not his girlfriend, his ex, they just broke up before the accident, like some uh, months ago or something. And he was like, yeah, I am. And she's like, where are you? I want, I want to see this. <laughs> you know? It's a rare thing. Yeah, it's a rare, yeah, rare thing. It's never like... So for me, it was quite powerful because I knew he was never crying. And he was standing there holding around uh, my friend Balal, crying. And I also thought it was such perfect that he was there because Balal grew up with him. Mm. They were... Uh, oh, so you yeah. knew that she was taken care of. Yeah, she was taken care of that he can comfort, comfort her. Right. You know? And uh, then I was thinking about my mom and my son. My mom has been through so much, so uh, so much shit, and going to the hospital, my little brother hanged himself, but he's alive now though, but she's going through a lot of, she's been through that shit hell before. And yeah, I she just, probably like, had like a PS uh, ex, yeah. Yeah, feeling. Yeah, so it was, uh, that also was about like, uh, that also was, uh, uh, like I said, I want to say sorry to her as well, mm. but... Yeah, and then they came and they said uh, they were on their way, bottle of were on their way, and they said they're gonna start the surgery soon. And when I woke up, uh, the first thing, of course, I was ask is, "Am I paralyzed? And like, how long is this gonna last, or whatever?" And she just said to me that, uh, unfortunately, uh, it looks very bad, and uh, you're paralyzed. And the, the thing, like the way we see it now, is that. Uh, you never, you will never walk again. And again, I was like, "Kid, okay, this is not happening. This, is not, this, this can't happen. This is my worst nightmare. I've always been. This can't happen." Mm. And uh, my girlfriend was there as well, and I just saw everyone around me. That this, how much pain it brought to my family, it brought to my girlfriend at that time. It's over now, but uh, how much? It's not just the injury, you know, it's, it's uh, everything around as well. And how scared they are of me mm. taking my life because they knew yeah, that I hated said, yeah. it. And I also said that I want to die if it happened, and now it happened. So it was, it's, been, it's been hell, and it still is. Since I was a kid, I always imagined visualizing how my future is. And if we're going to go in a cage, imagine the fight. I've always been very good at it. Yeah. So... Yeah, I don't know what to say, but it's it's been a hell of a ride. <laughs> it's been a hell of a ride, man. Oh man! And now we're here. I remember. Oh, I'm about to cry when I try to say it. I remember when I heard about it. I was like, "There's no way. There's just no way that happened." It was, yeah. It was uh, an impossible thing. You know, yeah. I remember I got just cried so much. And I heard it. And my kids were like, "Wow, well, Dad, what's up?" You know, mm. and they know who you are. Mm. And I just said that my friend, the most active guy I know, is uh, broke his back and can't walk. You know? And I remember my my daughter tried to comfort me because I said. Why is it so sad, you know, because we used to run through the forest, you know, and have such a good time. And she tried to comfort me and said, Dad, 
You're gonna run with him again. In his wheelchair. <laughs> you know, she was so cute. <laughs> but that was that was the best answer, though. Yeah, it was a really good answer. Yeah. She was uh, w- w- uh, she was eight at the time, seven or eight. Yeah. You know, so she's like that smart. Yeah, very smart. So uh, yeah, and we came to visit you last summer, about ten months ago, in the in the rehabilitation place. So it was a really good time. You know, yeah. obviously I started to cry immediately when I saw you, but that was a powerful moment. Yeah. That was really powerful, but. I knew that when I just uh, we were just hugging and crying, and uh, I felt that you know it was still you. Yeah, I really felt that. Yeah, I really felt that. Uh, but it was yeah, it was very very strange to see you like that. And it's strange now too, mm. but it's uh, it's also good, you know. Mm. Because I'm I'm still the same person, and that's yeah. also been the thing that people are being concerned about. Yeah, that you're gonna People change. People are really gonna change, uh, and and with everything you you say and everything you talk about, it's obvious that the strength you had from before, your determination, hasn't disappeared. It's just shifted focus, you know. Yeah. And uh, and you've been trying all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, tell tell me about that doctor you call the oxygen chamber. How you convinced him to help you? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I heard about a doctor called Scott Scher. Uh, I've done a lot of research on everything, the, all the biohacks out there, everything that optimizes my body. And then I seen a lot of his stuff, read about it, and uh, I thought I need to talk to the guy. And I sent him email. First, I did contacting him on uh, Instagram, I think. And I think I sent him an email. And then he said, like, yeah, I can talk to you. And that costs, like, 2,000 kroner and, like, $200 uh, for an hour. No, for, for 30 minutes. I'm like, yeah, it's worth it. And I wrote down all the questions and everything that I heard he talk about. Like, was, like what, were, what were those things? Uh, it was like, um, they don't know much about the hyperbaric chamber yet because it's so new. And... Uh, the, like since 2018 stuff will happen that they cannot explain like mostly in the brain but I'm thinking spine, you know, the spinal cord is like the brain so for me it also gave me hope about all my questions maybe can I give me better answers And so when I called him I said that I want I have order a hyperbaric chamber I'm going to order a hyperbaric chamber and he recommended me a company even though he sells uh, he sells him himself, he recommended another company called OxyHelp, and I contacted contacted them as well. Uh, already already contacted them, and uh, he I just uh, he just told me that remember this might not this is not don't think that this is getting on your feet like it, it we don't know but it's, it's a big chance it's not because we have tried on spinal cord injury. And I said to him, like, I've, I've read through a lot of the science behind it, and I heard all of his uh, talks, and one of the talks you said that when it comes to science, you cannot, you cannot do a study on hyperbaric chamber at the same time studying your, uh, you're doing keto, at the same time you're doing uh, infrared lightning or uh, magnetic field therapy, because then you don't know what gave you the results. Right, and you said that you even said that you don't know about how this would affect uh, other stuff as well. You use and his own words against him, basically. Exactly, and he was him. like, Man, "Yeah, so excited to like, yeah, it's, you're true, you're right." And he's also saying like, he said that because um, I told him about the 66 program that I'm that type of guy and I always use that as, as an example because then people think then they understand I'm not just saying that I'm going to do everything I'm really doing everything you've been to Panama done stem cells yeah the stem cells you've been, what, what else have you done uh, I did a 666 uh, six, six program yeah uh, I do a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, meditation um, uh, like uh, Joe Dispenza like really believing in trying to heal it yourself and all that so I do a lot of crazy stuff mm-hmm. that I believe in it's not crazy for me but for people or normal people normal people yeah. people around think it's crazy people think it's crazy to do a thousand push-ups on their vacation of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, so then he actually, he was like, okay. Yeah, then he thought it was interesting. And then I, I remember the, he, just the way he changed his voice was more like excited and mm. like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to this uh, secret group on Facebook and then you can ask questions and stuff there and maybe keep us updated what's happening. With all what sci- doing. Just a group of all scientists. the scientists and people using hyperbaric chamber and... Uh, so yeah, it was. Uh, then I was like, even more motivated, and I even told him. But remember, if I walk again, I'll be talking to you as well. You know. Yeah, I'll be mentioning your name. I'm mentioning your name. So yeah. that's cool, man. So you're already doing stuff that's uh, not normal for other people. Things that people don't expect, like yeah. your thighs, for instance. Your yeah. thighs. They, they, when people break their back. They turn into like a pinky. They're they're like super thin. Bone density goes down, and the yeah. thighs just like whoosh, go into chopstick mode. Yeah. How much have you lost? I've lost like two centimeters or something. That's that's not even an inch. Exactly. <laughs> After so over good. a year, it's so good. Yeah. And that show me that they also they don't know about it. They like like they question it as well, and that show me also that they don't know everything. Yeah. And what did your um, your doctor say? When uh, when it turns out that you were the one who didn't break his neck. Yeah, that was that. also strange for them because normally when people die, they break their neck and get paralyzed from neck and down. And uh, I just told the doctor the reason I think is because I did a military drive. When you do a normal dive, you probably look a little bit up and then you have your neck bent. But I would I was diving like straight. Also, because I have a lot of training in martial arts, so when we did, like, uh, for example, Thai boxing, when you drag someone in the neck for clinching, automatically you, will, you tense your neck and, uh, and uh, lift your shoulders so you get stronger. Mm. And also from the judo, we learned that when we fall, we should uh, lift our shoulders so we can tense it so we don't get the whiplash or anything, mm-hmm. you know? And also the wrestling training and everything, I think everything, all that saved me. When it comes to getting patterns from my neck and down, that would be worse, of course. That would be even worse, and yeah. I couldn't move my arm. Yeah. I'm just gonna check the program. Yeah. Uh, because I want to see the hyperbaric woman. It's now. Hyperbaric oxygen ju- now. Let's go. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Hmm. Thank <laughs> you.